I just finished up another 20 questions for you all. And a friendly reminder that these questions you're about to see are very similar to the ones you'll see on the actual Security Plus exam. And I don't want to waste any time. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, question one. You're a security analyst at a large retail chain. During a recent network scan, you discover several systems with open TCP port 25. Upon further investigation, you find no legitimate email servers running on these systems. Which of the following attacks is most likely being attempted? We have A, SQL injection, B, cross-site scripting, C, phishing, or D, open relay. All right, so it's important to know what each attack is. So let's go ahead and go down the list here. Uh, for A, SQL injection, when you investigate, you'll notice some like strange keyword commands. Um, so it's not that, and that also has nothing to do with port 25. Right, so cross-site scripting, this attack injects scripts in websites. Uh, it would have nothing to do with port 25. Phishing, this scenario doesn't have anything to do with phishing, and that has nothing to do with port 25. Uh, D, open relay. Uh, an open relay would allow attackers to send malicious emails without authorization. So I'm going to go with that D. Yep. In an open relay, anyone has the ability to send mail, obscure origin, and enabling spam, spoofing, and malware propagation. All right. Question two. You're a network administrator for a mid-sized company. You receive an alert about a sudden spike in network traffic originating from a specific user's workstation. Upon investigation, you observe unusual outbound connections to various IP addresses. However, the user claims they haven't intentionally initiated any such connections. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this activity? A. Phishing attack B. Zero-day exploit C, DNS poisoning, or D, botnet infection. So right away, I can rule out phishing attack and uh, zero-day exploit. So those are out. In this scenario, it specifically says the user claims they haven't intentionally initiated any connections. And usually when someone is phished, they could provide insight into like a weird email or something they got. So that's why I ruled out phishing attack. DNS poisoning would redirect traffic to a malicious website, but there usually wouldn't be multiple connections like the scenario. So I'm going to go with D here, botnet infection. Legitimate user activity, even heavy downloading or streaming, rarely involves sustained connection to such addresses. This pattern suggests the infected system is being controlled by an external command and control server associated with the botnet, coordinating its actions as part of its malicious network. Question three. You're a cybersecurity analyst investigating potential data breach at a healthcare organization. The incident involves the unauthorized access and exfiltration of sensitive patient records. Upon examining the logs, you discover a series of successful login attempts using legitimate employee usernames, but from IP addresses originating in a foreign country. Which of the following attacks is most likely responsible for this breach? A, SQL injection, B, cross-site scripting, C, credential stuffing, or D, password spraying? Let's look at the question again here. Okay, so the key to this question is where it says a series of successful login attempts using legitimate uh, employee usernames. And it, like understanding how that connection happened, right? Uh, so right away, it's not going to be an SQL injection. I mean, unless you're able to extract login credentials, which is very, very unlikely. It's not cross-site scripting, as the scenario doesn't have anything to do with like a website. So it's between credential stuffing or password spraying. 
I'm going to go with credential stuffing. Uh, the likelihood of multiple successful logins with password spraying is very low. So I'm going to go with C. Yep. Attacker successfully logged in using valid employee credentials, indicating they had possession of this sensitive information. However, the login originated from IP addresses in a foreign country, suggesting the attackers weren't the actual employees. Question four, a long one. You're the security analyst at a software development company. An automated vulnerability scanner flags several high severity vulnerabilities in a critical internal application hosting sensitive customer data. Upon investigation, you discover the vulnerabilities stem from outdated libraries integrated into the application. However, Updating these libraries would require extensive rewrites and potentially delay the upcoming product release. Which of the following actions should you prioritize as the most effective initial mitigation strategy to minimize risk and prevent an increase in development timelines? A. Immediately apply temporary network restrictions to isolate the vulnerable application. B. Deploy a honeypot to distract potential attackers. C. Implement strict access controls to limit user access to the vulnerable application. Or D. Negotiate with stakeholders to delay the product release and prioritize patching the vulnerabilities. All right. So let's go through each one and see why it would be a bad idea and rule that out. Uh, for A, I mean, Applying network restrictions to isolate like immediately, it could negatively affect the business operations. So it's not going to be that one. Deploying a honeypot isn't the answer. Uh, that can take a long time to implement that. Implement strict access controls to limit user access. I feel like this should already be implemented, but so far it's the best answer. Negotiate with stakeholders to delay the product release. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be that one. I'm going to go with C on this. Um, also a comp to you tip, usually. When you were asked questions about like immediate need or a timely fix, it's going to be the most likely the answer that would affect business operations the least. And out of this, I would say C. Okay. Scenario highlights the need for a swift yet measured response that reduces risk while acknowledging the development constraints. Question five. You're the security analyst monitoring incidents alerts at a large medical facility. An alert triggers for suspicious database activity indicating unauthorized access attempts towards patient records. Investigation reveals several successful connections to the database server from a compromised workstation inside the network. Which of the following actions should you prioritize as the most effective immediate response to contain the incident and minimize potential data breach? We have A. Immediately disconnect the entire network to prevent further access. B. Isolate the compromised workstation from the network. C, shut down the da database server to halt all access. Or D, change all user passwords and implement multi-factor authentication. All right. Well, it's definitely not going to be A. That's going to be a little extreme there. Um, it could be B, isolate the compromised workstation from the network. Definitely not C. That's a bit extreme. And it could be D. D. Let's see. So rereading the question, I'm going to go with B here, um, only because it says successful connections from a compromised workstation inside the network. I mean, the next step after that would be to contain the workstation that's still in the network. So I'm going to go with B for this one. All right. 
B is the best option because it prioritizes containment over system disruption, prevents further unauthorized access, and buys time for deeper investigation and remediation, safeguarding critical medical operations and sensitive patient data. Question six. Your company, a large e-commerce platform, recently suffered a significant data breach exposing customer PII. The CEO demands action to prevent future incidents and strengthen the overall security posture. You're the director of security tasked with outlining a strategic response plan. But which of the following should be the cornerstone of your proposed plan to achieve both incident response and long-term security improvements? We have A, implement the NIST cybersecurity framework. B, conduct a penetration testing engagement to identify immediate vulnerabilities. C, implement EDR tools. Or D, establish a cross-functional incident response team for coordinated action. All right, so for this one, it's asking which option is the best for incident response and long-term security improvements. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to rule out A. Although NIST has a section regarding incident response, it's not a response plan itself. Uh, it's not B. Pentis would help with current security posture, but doesn't improve long-term security posture. It might be C. EDR tools can help with incident response. And D is also a really good option. I mean, it satisfies the question the most. Establishing a cross-functional incident response team for coordinated action. So that's going to help with the incident response concern and also long-term, like a long-term plan. So I'm going to go with D. All right. Establishing a cross-functional incident response team serves as the foundation for both immediate incident response and long-term security improvements. It fosters coordinated action, strengthens communication, and lays the groundwork for a proactive security culture. All right, question seven. You're the chief security officer at a global manufacturing company facing increasing pressure from the board of directors for demonstrating improved security posture. Recent regulatory audits expose inconsistencies in security controls acts across the organization's geographically dispersed areas. Which of the following actions will most effectively demonstrate security improvements and satisfy the board's demands for progress? A. Implement a centralized SIM platform to consolidate security logs from all locations. B. Conduct a global penetration testing exercise to identify vulnerabilities across all network assets. C. Develop and enforce a standardized set of security policies and procedures for all subsidiaries. Or D. Implement a risk assessment framework to prioritize security investments based on identified risks. All right. So the way I picture this question is pretty much what do you do after that board meeting? Um, with that said, you're not going to implement a SIM, which stands for Security Information and Event Management. A global penetration test would take much longer to implement and would not satisfy the board's demands. D wouldn't satisfy the board either. I feel like the only one that makes sense here would be C. Let me just double check here. Yeah, I'm going to go with C here. All right. While all options contribute to improved security, developing and enforcing standardized security policies <clears throat> offers the most effective in demonstrating a pathway for showcasing tangible progress, addressing the board's concerns, and laying a strong foundation for future security initiatives across your globally dispersed organization. Question 8. Your company, a large healthcare provider, recently faced a ransomware attack that crippled operations and exposed patient data. You're the director of security, tasked with leading the recovery efforts and preventing future incidents. While an incident response plan existed, its execution was 
hampered by poor communication and lack of direction. Which of the following actions should be your top priority to prevent similar incidents in the future? We have A, conduct a vulnerability assessment and penetration testing to identify and patch system vulnerabilities. B, immediately invest in advanced security tools and technologies to strengthen your defenses. C, conduct security awareness training to improve their ability to identify and report suspicious activity. Or D, establish an IRP team with clearly defined roles and responsibilities along with regular training and drills. All right, so the question's asking, how do you fix poor communication and lack of direction during an incident? So let's go ahead and go down the list and see which one fits this problem here. So I'm going to rule out A here. Vulnerability assessment and pen test wouldn't improve the communication. Um, it's not B for the same reason. I mean, tools can be great and it helps, definitely helps, but it doesn't improve the communication. It's not C. Security awareness is great, but it doesn't help the communication, especially during, you know, the execution of an incident response. I'm going to go with D here. Establishing a dedicated incident response team with defined roles in ongoing training remains the top action to address the core problem, prevent similar incidents, and build a robust security posture for your healthcare organization. Question nine. You're the network administrator for a company experiencing unusual network traffic spikes during non-business hours. Upon investigation, you discover unauthorized connections originating from the company's web servers on port uh, 6660, a port not associated with any authorized services. Which of the following actions should be your top priority to mitigate the immediate threat and prevent future unauthorized access? A, immediately shut down the affected web servers to isolate the compromised systems. B, implement port filtering rules to block outgoing traffic on port 6660 from all web servers. C, change the passwords for all user accounts with access to the web servers. Or D, conduct a forensic analysis of the web servers to identify the source of the unauthorized connections. Okay. For this one, right away, B jumps out to me. Um, unauthorized connections originated from the company's web server on port 6660. A port not associated with any authorized services, meaning it's not critical. Uh, the best option is to just block the outgoing traffic on that port. I mean, that would be an immediate fix without hurting business operations. So out of all these options, B is the best option. I'm going to go with B. It directly addresses the immediate unauthorized communication, prevents further data breach or damage, and buys time for future further investigation and remediation without significantly impacting legitimate services. Question 10. You're the physical security manager for a research facility containing sensitive scientific data. Recently, during a routine security inspection, you discover an unauthorized network cable connected to a restricted server room, bypassing standard security measures. Which of the following actions should be your top priority to address this immediate threat and ensure ongoing physical and network security? A. Disconnect the unauthorized cable and initiate an investigation to identify the responsible party and their motives. B. Secure the server room with additional locks and access controls to prevent further unauthorized access to the equipment. C. Track the connected device via network scanning for further investigation. Or D. Disable the port that the unauthorized network enable was connected to to prevent this from happening again. So the scenario... Um, discovered an unauthorized network cable connected to a restricted server room. So that confirms that it's not supposed to be there. So in this scenario, they know that. 
in this scenario, I mean, it's important to disconnect that cable right away. So the first thing you would want to do when you have like a road connection is to get rid of the road connection after you verify that it's an authorized connection, if that makes sense. And at the end of the day, if you're a physical security manager, you're going to know if it's supposed to be there or not. So I'm going to go with A. All right. It directly neutralizes the immediate threat, preserves evidence, minimizes disruption, and lays the foundation for a comprehensive investigation. Question 11. Your company relies on cloud applications for critical operations. To streamline access and boost security, you're implementing SSO. What's the top priority when evaluating SSO solutions? A, wide range of supported integrations. B, strong authentication methods like MFA. C, easy deployment and management or D, industry-specific vendor experience. I feel like there's a pretty short and easy one here. Um, the key word here is boost security. And only one of these potential answers has anything to do with security, and that's B so far. Um, option A wouldn't be more secure than B. Easy deployment shouldn't be done at the cost of security. And D just doesn't make any sense for me, given the scenario. So I'm going to go with B here. All right. All op options offer advantages. Prioritizing strong authentication methods like MFA ensures the most secure and impactful implementation of SSO for your cloud-based operations. Question 12. You're the security officer for a rapidly growing healthcare company handling sensitive patient data. Your current security program is lacking clear policies, procedures, and is struggling to keep pace with new technologies and regulations. Management needs a revised approach to ensure efficient security operations and data protection. Which of the following actions should be your top priority to establish a more effective security governance structure? A, conduct a comprehensive security audit to identify all existing vulnerabilities and security gaps. B, focus on acquiring the latest security tools and technologies to stay ahead of evolving cyber threats. C, align your security strategy with the organization's overall business goals and risk tolerance to ensure effective resource allocation. D, conduct a comprehensive inventory of all IT assets and sensitive data to understand the organization's attack surface and prioritize protection efforts. Oh, there's a lot in this one. Let's see here. Top priority to establish a more effective security governance structure. Yeah, it's kind of a keyword there, governance. Um, and that kind of goes along with business goals, right? So. For this one, the one that aligns the best with me for this scenario is going to be C. A security governance structure is pretty much the framework for the business security posture in a way. And in order to have efficient security operations, you need to align it with your business goals. So I'm going to go with C. All options play a role. Prioritizing alignment of your security strategy with the organization's business goals and risk tolerance remains the top action for, pro for effective security governance in this scenario. Question 13. You're the IT security analyst for a small hospital. Your current risk register lists generic threats but lacks specific de details about vulnerabilities in your medical devices. Management prioritizes patient safety and wants a more granular understanding of device-related risks. Which action should be your top priority to improve the risk register for medical devices? A. Conduct a comprehensive penetration test on all medical devices to identify specific vulnerabilities. B. Research industry reports and advisories to gather detailed information about known medical device vulnerabilities. C. 
interview clinical staff and IT personnel to understand how medical devices are used and identify potential misuse risks. Or D, collaborate with the medical device vendors to obtain vulnerability assessments and security best practices for their products. Uh, I feel like this is a pretty simple one here. Um, let's go ahead and go down the list here. It's not going to be A. That would be very time consuming and very costly. And probably, you know, depending on the device, not practical or possible, actually. Um, it's not going to be C. Knowing how something works doesn't mean there won't be any vulnerabilities. It helps. But it's not, it's not C. And it's not going to be D. While this also helps, I mean, there may be vulnerabilities that they're not even aware of. I'm going to go with B here. The immediate need for detailed information about known vulnerabilities makes researching industry reports and advisories the top priority in this scenario. Question 14. That's a lot to read. <laughs> You're the security awareness officer for a large construction company with geographically dispersed employees. Recent security incidents highlight the need for improved data security awareness, particularly surrounding mobile devices used for work. Management wants to implement the best approach to educate employees and reduce data breaches on mobile devices. Which of the following options would be the most effective strate strategy to achieve this goal? We have A, develop and distribute a comprehensive security handbook covering all aspects of mobile device security with detailed technical instructions. B, create engaging video tutorials and infographics showcasing best practices for data protection on mobile devices and available through a corporate app. C. Conduct mandatory security awareness sessions across all locations featuring interactive activities and simulated phishing attacks focused on mobile devices. D. Partner with IT to offer mobile device security audits and personalized recommendations for individual employees based on their device usage patterns. Okay. The most effective strategy to implementing an approach to educate employees on security awareness. Essentially, is what this is. Let's look at A. I mean, A isn't practical. People can just choose not to read it, and they will choose not to read it. B has the same problem as A. C, I'm leaning towards this one. It's mandatory training. It's interactive, has activities, and that's the best way, based on my actual real-life experience, that is the best way to teach security awareness. And it's definitely not D. Personalized solutions for employees will be very time-consuming and a lot of work. I want to go C here. All right. The interactive and targeted approach of mandatory security awareness sessions with simulations provides the most effective way, true, to educate employees, build skills, and ultimately reduce data breaches on mobile devices in this scenario. Question 15. Your company relies on passwords for user authentication. Recent security audits revealed concerns about password strengths and potential rainbow table attacks. Management wants to significantly improve password security without increasing login complexity for users. Which of the following would be the best option to strengthen passwords and mitigate rainbow table threats without adding complexity for users? We have A, implement MFA for all user accounts. B, enforce stricter password complexity requirements like minimum lengths and character types. C, implement salting with a unique random value for each user password. D, implement hashing algorithms with larger digest size, like SHA-3. Let's take a look here. 
Um, so looking at this scenario here and the question, the key here is a solution, right? That strengthens passwords without adding complexity for users. And that's key there. Um, and it's also about mitigating rainbow table threats. Both A and B, while great practices, would technically add complexity during login for users. And D doesn't mitigate rainbow table threats. So I would say C. It would have the least amount of impact on users and it would also make rainbow tables useless by salting the passwords. So I'm going to go with C. Yep. Salting effectively renders pre pre-computed rainbow tables useless. The unique random value appended to each password before hashing creates a vast number of possible combinations, making these tables impractical for attackers to use. Yep. Question 16. You're the security analyst for a popular e-commerce website experiencing frequent crashes and suspicious user activity. Recent investigations identified various vulnerabilities within the web application itself. Management wants to prioritize patching efforts to address the most critical security risks immediately based on the activity noticed. Which type of vulnerability should first be patched and mitigated? We have A, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that display malicious code in user browsers. B, broken authentication and authorization controls allowing unauthorized access to user accounts. C, unvalidated input vulnerabilities, allowing attackers to inject malicious code into web forms or requests. D, SQL injection vulnerabilities, enabling attackers to manipulate database queries and steal information. All right, so it's asking which to patch first based on the symptoms noticed. So let's go ahead and take a look at that, those symptoms again here. Uh, the symptoms, frequent crashes, and suspicious activity. It's also asking for the most critical security risk. I'm going to rule out A and C. Those two don't describe the symptoms and... Well, I think kind of do, but they aren't the biggest risk. Um, this is just something that I know, but according to OWASP, the biggest risk in web applications is broken access. Because of that, I want to say B. It could also be C, though, based on... Oh, that's a tough one. Based on the symptoms. Broken authentication and authorization controls, I feel like that wouldn't cause a lot of crashes. But unvalidated input vulnerabilities would and that would also be suspicious activities uh not even relating to crashes i could be wrong here um i think that i'm gonna go with c just double check here which type of vulnerability should first be patched and mitigated based on the symptoms, because that's what the question is asking, based on the symptoms noticed. Broken authentication doesn't cause crashes. It would have suspicious activity, but so would C. I'm going to go with C here. I could definitely get this one wrong, though. Yep. Should have went with uh, my OWASP guess there. <laughs> Let's read it here. Exploiting broken authentication or authorization grants attackers direct access to user accounts, potentially compromising sensitive data, stealing financial information, or even impersonating legitimate users. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I should have stuck with my gut there. All right. Can't get them all right. Question 17. You're the security analyst for a pharmaceutical company developing a new breakthrough medication. Recent investigations revealed unauthorized access to your network and potential data breaches. Management prioritizing, pr prioritizes protecting sensitive information, including research data, formulas, and marketing strategies related to the new medication. Which, type should, which data type should be your top priority 
for enhanced security measures due to its critically and potentially impact in this scenario. I cannot read today. Potential impact in this scenario. We have A, PII of clinical trial participants. B, proprietary software used for data analysis and modeling. C, internal employee communications and project management documentations. D, trade secrets related to the new medications formula and composition. Okay, so some keywords here is it's asking what data type. So that's a key here. Um, and it also specifically says research data formulas and marketing strategies related to the new medication. And it wants to protect that. Um, so ruling out B, B and C right away, those aren't data types. Uh, PII, you know, is important to protect. Given the scenario, though, I'm leaning towards trade secrets. It's, I mean, the question in the scenario is protecting the company's, like, research formulas, things like that. And that's going to be trade secrets. So I'm going to go with D here. Trade secrets encompass valuable confidential information not publicly known and critical to the company's competitive advantage. Question 18. You're the security administrator for a government agency responsible for handling highly classified information. Recent audits revealed inconsistencies in how different departments classify and protect sensitive data. Management wants to standardize data classification procedures to ensure consistent and appropriate security measures. Which of the following classification levels should be your top priority for implementing stricter controls and access restrictions due to its high sensitivity and potential impact in this scenario? A, public information that can be freely shared with the public. B, sensitive but, classified, but unclassified data requiring limited access controls. C, confidential information requiring restricted access and protection measures. D, top secret information with the highest level of classification and strictest, ac strictest access controls. I think it's kind of a confusing question here, right? Um, there's a lot of information in this scenario that really doesn't mean anything to answer this question, which, by the way, a little tip here is a lot of CompCA questions are like that. Well, it looks like the question is pretty much asking which type of classification will need the highest level of security, right? Um, and with that being said, absolutely, that's going to be D, top secret. That's the highest out of the classifications. That's going to need the most security and controls. So I'm going to go with D. Top secret information encompasses highly sensitive data, the unauthorized disclosure of which could cause exceptionally grave damage to national security foreign relations, or public safety. Question 19. You're the security analyst for a company with a large remote workforce using personal mobile devices for work. Recent reports indicate suspicious activity on some employee devices, possibly malware infections. Management wants to proactively assess the potential threats without compromising sensitive corporate data on those devices. Which of the following sandbox solutions would be the best option for analyzing suspicious apps and files downloading on employee mobile devices. We have A, a cloud-based mobile app sandbox. B, a network-based sandbox integrated with your uh, MDM system. C, an on-device sandbox app installed directly on employee devices. Or D, a physical sandbox using a dedicated isolated mobile device. Hmm. So let's go ahead and use the process of elimination on this one here. Uh, I mean, when we're thinking remote devices, we have to think big picture here, right? And a solution that's convenient for both security analysts and the employee themselves. Uh, also, it's important to know that it's on a personal device, not company issued. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to rule out C and D. These would not be convenient to troubleshoot at all. So I'm ruling out C and D, which leaves us with A or B. Uh, 
I mean, companies are going to use MDM solutions so they can manage and secure company information. So I'm going to go with B, uh, especially with it being network based. That's going to detect and being able to analyze a lot of malware because the majority of malware is going to connect to a network in one way or another. So I'm going to go with B. Integrating with your MDM system allows for centralized control and analysis of suspicious apps and files from various employee devices. This centralized approach streamlines analysis and reporting. All right, last question. Question 20. As the IT technician for a small medical clinic, you're tasked with upgrading your aging server hardware. However, you're unsure how to securely dispose of the retired servers containing sensitive patient data. Management prioritizes data security during the disposal process. Which of the following disposal methods is the best option for ensuring data security in this scenario? We have A, degaussing the hard drives and physically destroying them using a drill. B, formatting the hard drives multiple times and reselling them online. C, wiping the data with software specifically designed for secure data erasure. D, sending the entire servers to a certified e-waste recycling facility. Okay, so something important to point out here is the scenario is it specifically says dispose of retired serving servers, meaning you're not going to reuse them. You're not going to need them. Um, with that being said, the question is asking what's the best option for ensuring data security in this scenario? So based on this, the answer is going to be which is a more permanent solution, right? Um, so going through these, it's not going to be B. There could still be data residue on that, even though you erased it multiple times. Very hard to get after erasing it multiple times, but it's still possible. Now, if you're going to keep the devices, reuse them or resell them, it didn't say anything about selling them. But if you were, then C would be the best option. Um, out of all of these, I'm going to go with A. I mean, having you or somebody in your company physically destroying them using a drill is going to be a way to make the, it a permanent solution, right? Um, you could do D and send the entire servers to a certified e-waste recycling facility. Um, and they would give you like uh, a certificate of destruction for that, which proves that this device was destroyed. But there could still be data leakage going from your company to that company, right? It can still happen. It has happened in the past. I would say out of all of these, the based on the scenario, and the answer is the best option is going to be A, just physically destroying them yourself. Yep. If the primary concern is protecting the data on the hardware, physically destroying the hardware would be the safest way to ensure the security of the data. Physically destroying offers the guarantee that the information is permanently unrecoverable. Okay, well, I got one wrong, got my first one wrong, but hey, it happens. Um, anyway, thank you. If you've watched this far, I really appreciate it. You're awesome. Um, but yeah, if you liked the video, go ahead and leave a, you know, a like, if you didn't like it, go ahead and dislike it. Leave a comment if you have any questions, but I appreciate it.